We're in 1 Timothy chapter 2. The part is 2 on the subject of the salvation of God. It is uh, simply a very elementary uh, presentation of salvation. We've been doing this to try to help those that have just come into the message. Uh, and rather than to go into the deeper things, sometimes it's good to uh, present just a little bit of milk and uh, then go on. Uh, we, we do appreciate um, uh, the, the music this morning. You know, Margaret Bufkin does an excellent job on the organ, and uh, we've made mention of this time and again. And, but she always refers to the fact, uh, and this is, uh, uh, she has done this publicly, so I'm not letting anything out of school. She said about her age, at her age, if she only had this, that, and the other. But I think she does uh, a terrific job, despite, quote, her age, if that, as if that made a difference. But um, I, had, I had one better. Uh, Pastor Carl Klum out in Ohio, I heard. Now, he, he is still a pa Is he still living? I yeah, I think he's still, he's still living. Um, but uh, anyway, a, a past, they were referring to Pastor Carl Klum's uh, a church uh, out there. And anyway, uh, uh, whether or not he's still living, his <laughs> father and mother-in-law are still living. Uh, he, they are 95 and 92, respectively. And uh, the father-in-law is the song leader of the church, and the mother-in-law is the organist. So, Miss Margaret, you have a ways to go. You're, you're just a young person, comparatively. But uh, sometimes the... Uh, Diseases of the aged are contagious, and Max had a terrible, terrible time this morning, and so did I, and I just want to uh, say I made two mistakes. It, it absolutely pierces my male ego to say that I made a mistake, but I made two of them. One was, uh, I didn't mean to say that it was a, we were talking about uh, soterion. I didn't mean to say that it was a feminine verb. Um, that's, uh, nouns can be masculine, feminine, and so forth, and, and not the verbs. But I was trying to make a point there that it was a masculine noun, and that uh, has to do with an external package. That's why we can deem it the salvation package. And also, the if is not third-class condition, as if it makes any difference with some of you, but it does to me, because the perfectionist that I am, it's a first-class condition and should be translated since. Why I got off on that rabbit trail, which was totally wrong, I'll never know. But it does make a difference in how you translate it. We've been talking about salvation. And the fact that it is a common experience to us all. You got saved exactly the same way that I did. Uh, the circumstances externally may have been different, but the internal action was the same. God has the monopoly on salvation. He's provided it for us. And we saw this morning in the Sunday School Hour that that simply means that He desires that everyone be saved. Everyone be brought into a right relationship with Him. From Isaiah 45, we saw it that every race was considered in this salvation package. Again from Isaiah, every generation. My salvation shall be sent, he says, from one generation to another. And then lastly, every person born comes under that umbrella of God desires their salvation. Then that brought us to the fact that uh, to the contrary of some, we teach that there is an unlimited atonement. Now what does that mean? There are those, and we'll look at it in just a little bit, that are extreme Calvinists. Though Calvin himself didn't teach this doctrine to the extreme, there are those, and it's becoming more prevalent, uh, that do, that only those who are the elect uh, are those for whom Christ died. And that too is a false teaching. And we saw from Romans 3 that all sinned and therefore all can be saved. That's exactly what Paul teaches. Paul doesn't teach that Jesus Christ died for just a few who sinned. He says all are under sin, all are guilty, all are under the law, and therefore salvation is presented to all that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So we saw from 2 Corinthians 5 that salvation and the atonement is potential for every unbeliever. But it's actual or made personal only for those who trust in Jesus Christ as Savior. Now we have another verse of Scripture, and that's where we're going to start now in 1 Timothy chapter 2. 
that teaches us that Jesus Christ was made a ransom, not just for a few, but for all. Verse 3, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator, one go-between, between God and man, and that's the man Christ Jesus. Now, uh, this, this bridge, this go-between between the Father and all men uh, doesn't have a sign on it, <laughs> this race excluded, this person excluded. The sign across that bridge is to the whosoever will. That is an all-inclusive term. And of course it means that the bridge is for any and all who will cross it. Because Jesus Christ gave himself a ransom just for a certain group? No. A ransom for all to be testified in due time. Now that word ransom uh, there is an important word because it has to do with being purchased from a slave market. The Agora was the ancient uh, meeting place to buy food and, and have uh, public discussions and so forth. But if you went down there, not only could you buy apples and oranges and some meat and whatever other products that you needed, if you needed a good household slave, you could go down there and bid for one at the Agora. And the redemptive price was known as a ransom. And if you had enough money, and this is a good slave, he's got uh, all of his teeth, you know, you make sure you look a good workhorse in, in the mouth first, make sure he's got all his teeth, uh, he's got his muscles, uh, uh, he's got uh, some youth and vigor, he'll, he'll last you a long time and the price may go up for that, but you've got the money and you want this workhorse, and so you can purchase one from the slave market, and you can, you can own. Well, in that sense, Jesus Christ gave himself the ransom. The price was high. God the Father demanded a perfect sacrifice, and Jesus Christ provided that for how many people? For all of us who are chained to the slave market of sin. How many is that? Romans 3.23, all have sinned. And that's the point. The ransom was provided for all, so that at any time, a person can leave that slave market by simply accepting that ransom. All right, let's go back to the book of 1 John. The book of 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. Jesus Christ is the satisfaction for the world. And I want you to note the two words modifying world in this verse. And he, Jesus Christ, is the satisfaction, literally. We've discussed this word before many times. It means the fully satisfying sacrifice. You know, when God looks down, it says he, that he smelled a sweet savor, and that indicated that the, uh, the sacrifice was pleasing to him. Jesus Christ was fully satisfying to the righteousness and justice of the Father when he died on the cross. When the Father came and smelled the aroma of that sacrifice, uh, God the Father said, Well done, my son. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. But I want you to see the end part of this verse. He, said, he is the satisfaction, note, says John, for our sins. This is a reference to believers. Absolutely. You, if you don't have a relationship, unless you have a sacrifice that was satisfying to the righteous demands of the Father. But note the potential. But not for ours only. And that's the point we want to make here. It's not just something for the elect. Uh, in fact, you don't even become elect until you believe. And that's another point that we're going to make. But here... It's also for the sins of, and here's the modifying, the whole world. Never has there been a person born that has been excluded from the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. God has provided an unlimited atonement. The blood of Jesus Christ wasn't shed for just a few, but it was a few elite. It was for all. All right, now there are some conclusions then. <laughs> that we want to come to. Psalms 98. Psalms 98. 
The conclusions are going to be twofold. The first one is this. Because God monopolizes salvation, but because he also extends it in an unlimited fashion to all, therefore we must conclude that God's grace is shown or extended to every member of the human race. Uh, sometimes I've had people say, well, what about the heathen? What about the uh, Hottentot? What about that person in darkest Africa or on the rivers of Amazon? What about those people that have never heard? Of course, the, the Word of God teaches that every person has heard in one form or another so that they are without excuse. Now, that should not diminish our missionary zeal because the commission is for us to go to the world. But in a behind-the-scenes fashion, God's grace is shown either through creation or conscience or Holy Spirit conviction. We've discussed that before. We just simply want to, in a very uh, casual way, peruse through these truths. Chapter 98, verse 3. And he hath remembered his mercy and truth toward the house of Israel. Last part of the verse establishes our point. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. You can rest assured that God the Holy Spirit is convicting the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment to come. That doesn't uh, exclude you from your responsibility, but it just simply means that God is working to bring people to Himself. Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23, we are going to use this in conjunction with Acts chapter 17. And again, I refer you to our study on the Tower of Babel. God dispersed mankind. Now that was an act of judgment. And by the way, it was an act of nonviolent judgment. Uh, it's an interesting thing. God usually gives judgment in kind or the kind of judgment that is needed. And in this particular case, they wanted to have a one world government without violence or by nonviolence. And God said, that's fine. Nonviolently, I'll just change your language and judge you and spread you uh, around the face of the world. But that was also a blessing or could be to the nations of the world. Why? Because he then extends himself in their geographical boundary, in their society, in their culture, through their government. He then extends himself to them so that they might be saved. So, verse number 23 says, and note this, Am I a God at hand? Rhetorically. Uh, yes, of course you are. It's a, it's a question he's simply asking in a rhetorical fashion. The answer is obviously, yes, I'm here. I don't want to be afar off, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off. No. Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? Now, again, there are times when God says that he is afar off. But as far as the initial salvation process is concerned, he is close at hand. How do we know? Acts chapter 17. Why did God judge the nations at Babel? Why did he change their language? So that they might have to go to a corner of the globe that he has established. It can be their homeland, their fatherland. They have their own distinct language so that they can be evangelized in that language. If they had stayed at Babel under Nimrod's auspices, <laughs> none of them would be saved. But because he dispersed them, verse number 26, Acts 17, it says, He made of one blood all the nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth. Remember, they weren't at Babel. So he said, off you go, change their language. He hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Why? That they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him. Why? Because he's not far from every one of us. That's what he said in Jeremiah. I'm not far off. 
I want to have a relationship. If I simply created the world and then disappeared and did my own thing, you'd never have a relationship with me. Uh, I just want to remind you that I haven't taken a vacation, that I'm at hand. That's why he dispersed the nations, and it just simply is another proof of the point that God is extending his grace to the human race. He wants people to be saved. And of course, in the dispensation of grace, Titus chapter 2. Rather than judging the world as he will do in the tribulation, principle, always grace before judgment, but the greatest manifestation of the grace of God is this dispensation. And the Apostle Paul teaches in verse number 11, the grace of God. The one that brings salvation hath appeared to all men. Behind the scenes, God the Holy Spirit is working in three ways. One, once a person is born, potential for salvation starts at conception, then birth, and it brings a person to God consciousness. In other words, as you're growing up, you, um, uh, you have uh, parents or you see somebody at a restaurant or you go by a church and what have you, and you ask mommy and daddy, what is that? And that's a church. Well, what do they do there? Well, they worship God. Well, what are those people doing bowing their head? Or why do we have to bow our head? Well, we're thanking God. And that brings a young person to God consciousness. Well, God the Holy Spirit even does that in those cultures where there is uh, no prayer to the true and living God. But the point is behind the scenes, Means, according to Romans chapter 1, they are brought to a realization of God. Then, as they grow, they can decide for themselves. And as God sends light, they respond to that light in the age of accountability. If they want more light, if they want that relationship, if they desire it with their heart, yes, there's a God. If I could only know how to have a relationship with him. Uh, there are many missionaries that have gone into these remote places. And the people have said, we, we knew there was a God like that. We wanted to have a relationship, but we didn't know how. God has sent you our way. It just simply means that at the age of accountability, uh, God the Holy Spirit brings us to this. And if you want more light, God is obligated to give you a gospel hearing. That's what it says in Romans chapter 10. Let's turn there. Romans chapter 10. Verse 14, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How then shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. They have not all obeyed the gospel. Isaiah said, who's believed our report? But faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And verse number 18 simply tells us, that have they not heard again the answer is yes their sound went into all the earth their words into the ends of the world how did god do that through the thing, three things i just mentioned conscience or creation conscience and the convicting power of god the holy spirit that we'll see in just a little bit all right point number two then in our conclusion God's grace is shown to every man, regardless of where they are on this planet. And therefore, if man is not saved, we must conclude that it's not God's fault. He doesn't want to be. What is the indictment against man? He was a drug pusher. Nope, he was an unbeliever. Uh, he was a carouser. Nope, he was an unbeliever. He did all the things wrong. He was a bank robber and a murderer. No, his name wasn't written in the Lamb's Book of Life. What's the worst crime a person can commit? Disbelief in Jesus Christ. All the others are incidental. 
Having an old sin nature that is not uh, forgiven and uh, removed whenever you are resurrected. That's the crime. Not trusting Christ as Savior. Now, these others are crimes and these others are wrong, but they're incidental to having that sin nature unforgiven, to having your will in resistance and opposition to Jesus Christ. If you're not saved, it's your fault, not God's. He has done everything by grace to see that you're saved. Now, how do we know? that God wants people saved and has done everything. John chapter 3. During the first advent, God the Father sent the Son. Verse 17 says, God sent not the Son the first time into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, if the world rejects him during their lifetime and dies in that state, yes, they're still condemned. But when Jesus came the first time, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He was concerned about their salvation. But now, he that believeth on him is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed. That's the greatest sin that one could ever commit. That's the sin. Yes, these others are bad. But the worst one is saying, I don't need Christ. I don't want Christ. I don't want what he did on the cross. I don't think it's a valuable thing. And they tread upon the precious saving blood of Christ. That's the condemnation. But further, and we're talking about God sending light to all. This is the further condemnation that light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. If a man's not saved, it's because he doesn't want to be saved. God has bent over backwards at the cross and is still bending over backwards in grace to make sure that man is saved, but they won't come to the light. For everyone that does evil hates the light, neither comes to the light, lest their deeds should be reproved. But he that does truth comes to the light that his deeds are wrought in God. Verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Again, the point is this. No one has an excuse for not being saved. If you wanted to be saved, you could be. God will provide the means and the message and the messenger. He has provided, Romans chapter 3, an object of salvation. <clears throat> we'll just notice these quickly because we still have a little more material to go <clears throat> through and uh, tonight we're going to have the, the business meeting so I'd like to finish up. We'll go through these quickly and try to finish this message this morning. It's the object of salvation. Verse 26, Romans 3. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness. If you're going to have a relationship with God, you must have the same righteousness as God. <laughs> uh, God will not compromise his absolute correctness of his person. He will not say, well, like we said last week in entering the family of God. Sometimes moms will say, don't eat that cookie or I'm going to smack your hand. You know, you're going to spoil your supper. Uh, but then after about the third or fourth cookie, they're still warning. What are they doing? They're compromising their righteousness just a little bit because they love their young uh, people. Well, God loves us, but he loves his righteousness more. And he will not compromise. He can't be God and compromise his righteousness. He must take a stand, draw the line, and say, let the chips fall where they may. But he will provide us with righteousness in an imputed fashion by doing what? Believing in the object of salvation. Who is that? That he might be just and the justifier of him that believes in the object, Jesus Christ. John chapter 18. It's, um, John, I'm sorry, it's John 16. I know what it was. As I was putting this on here, we, I had a couple of interruptions. That's, that does it sometimes. I look up and I look down and I put the wrong thing on here. Verse 8, this is John 16.
And when he, the Holy Spirit, has come, he will reprove. And we're going to deal with that at the, toward the end of the message here. There is a revealer of salvation. The first thing that must be revealed is the sinful condition of a human being. Uh, how often many of you have testified to me, I witness to a person, but they don't think they're bad. I haven't killed anybody. I try to keep the Ten Commandments. I'm a good person. What does God the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit reproves. The first thing that the Spirit does is help them to see their lostness. He reproves the world of sin, of righteousness, of judgment to come. What is the sin that determines their lost condition? They believe not on me. Of righteousness, they need a righteous standard. I go to my Father, you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. You are the fa your father, the devil, the lust of your father, you will do. And as he was a murderer from the beginning, you enter into that. You're spiritual murderers like the devil. And then lastly, 1 Timothy chapter 3. Verse that was read this morning. Uh, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 15. The object of salvation, Jesus Christ. The revealer of salvation, the Holy Spirit. God has provided all of these. Christ has completed his work. The Holy Spirit is still uh, in process of completing his work. And the word of God still stands true for those who might believe. That from a child, Timothy, here is God consciousness, age of accountability, and gospel hearing. Now, Timothy had the advantage of having a grandmother and a mother that uh, would lead them into the truth of the Scripture. But regardless, from a child, God the Holy Spirit is working, too. You have known the Holy Scriptures. Now, what can they do? They are able to make you wise to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. God has provided these three things to all men so that they are without excuse. If men want to be saved, they can be saved. Now, the last part of uh, our time together is going to be spent on some erroneous concepts of salvation. What are they? Universalism. I'm just going to make a comment on these three, and we're going to spend our uh, last moments on the fourth. In the Grace Movement, uh, some time ago, there were a group of people who broke off from us. They called themselves Universal Reconciliationists. And they simply said that all mankind is automatically saved. If Jesus died for all, they said, then everybody's going to be saved. There's no need to evangelize because people in the end, even if they have lived a bad life and all, all the things that accompany that, God's grace is going to overwhelm them and they'll be saved in the end anyway. So don't evangelize. And of course, that's wrong. Uh, the book of Revelation tells us those not written in the Lamb's book of life, which comes by faith, of course, are what? Cast into the lake of fire. Universal reconciliationism is not right. Technically speaking, they teach that everyone is automatically saved because Jesus died for all. Secondly, Sacerdotalism, I like that, uh, because a minister uh, performs sacerdotal exercises. That's what we're doing up here. But sacerdotalism simply means this, that only the priesthood saves, that a priest must hear your confession. This, of course, is Romanism, but uh, there are other churches who preach a, a similar thing, that unless you are able to see an external change of life, that one person can pronounce that the other person is saved or unsaved based on what they see. The problem with that is that you can become morally clean. You can turn over a new leaf. You can change your life. You can quit doing drugs and so forth. But the Bible teaches that the only way you can be saved is by something that happens invisibly. Now, yes, most often there's an immediate change of life, but it happens invisibly simply 
in a moment's time telling the Father you're a sinner and that you're believing in Christ to save. Thirdly, autosoterism. Man saves himself. Now we know from Romans chapter 3 that there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understands. There's none that seeks God. If God didn't take the initiative, we would all be lost. Mankind, therefore, cannot save himself. He doesn't even understand the issues unless God the Father sends God the Holy Spirit to help him out. Now here's the last thing we're going to discuss, and we don't... <laughs> We don't have time to do it justice, but I will simply mention these things and have you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 There is a doctrine out called Calvinism. We might uh, also call it particularism. Why? Because in essence what they believe is that God only chose um, to save some. Not all. That despite all of the verses in Scripture that says that God loves the world and that the world can be saved, God really meant, they say, that only a few can be saved. Now there are uh, untold problems with this. And we're going to, uh, when the time we have remaining here, just simply mention their five basic tenets, show you what God the Holy Spirit does, and then we're through. What does particularism or Calvinism believe? First of all, they believe in total depravity. Now, a problem with this is, <laughs> we believe the man is totally depraved too. But one thing that we believe that they don't is that man can believe. That if so enabled by God the Holy Spirit, a man can trust Jesus Christ as Savior. God doesn't do his believing for him. In other words, it's, it, it would be God playing a game. Uh, he would be telling you, believe, but you couldn't believe unless he made you believe, and then he wouldn't make you believe, and then he'd damn you for not doing what he told you to do, when only he could make you do it to begin with. Now, that sounds like double talk, but that's exactly what they, what they believe. That man is, uh, is uh, totally depraved and therefore uh, cannot believe. And those that are saved are simply zapped by God. And I'm, I'm using facetious language uh, into believing. And that he just chooses a few. And they use this illustration. You take a handful of pencils and you throw them up in the air. And you reach out your hand and how many would you grab? You'd just be able to grab some because they'd be scattered. And God chose to grab some and let the rest go to hell. That is nonsense. That is blasphemous. That is wrong. Yes, men are totally depraved, but if given the proper conditions, they can in and of themselves believe. Now, I'll show you what I mean. All glory is still going to go to God, but they still, when presented with the gospel, can believe. Secondly, unconditional election. What do I mean by that? That there are certain people that God has elected and he's elected them unconditionally, that is not on the basis of their faith. Uh, it's interesting that uh, Titus says, on the, according to the faith of God's elect. Limited atonement, we've just discussed that, that Christ only died for the elect. Irresistible grace, that if God calls you, you cannot oppose. And that boy, that, that's one that's uh, so fantastic. Uh, Stephen, a year after Pentecost, told the Sanhedrin, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. What is hardness of heart? What is blindness of eyes and closed ears if it is not a resistance to God's message? They see it, they hear it, they understand it, but they don't want to believe it. And that is resisting. And yet uh, the extreme Calvinists believe in irresistible grace, that you cannot say no to God if he calls. And then lastly, the perseverance of the saints, that if you're truly saved, you're going to be saved to the end. Now, 
We could spend time here on a lot of verses of Scripture. With the remaining time we have, just let me say this, that the Holy Spirit does two things in common grace for every person. Here's the Holy Spirit, and here is common grace. Verse number 14. But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him, neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. The first thing that he does is help us in perceiving. We do not have a human spirit. We're dead in that realm. But God the Holy Spirit acts as a human spirit for us so that we might be able, at least for that moment, to perceive the claims of Christ, to understand what's going on. He works behind the scenes, and uh, he is convicting of sin, of righteousness, of judgment. And then you come along because here is a person here who is ripe for salvation, and you give him the message of the gospel, and the Holy Spirit acts as a human spirit in enabling the person to perceive. Now, somebody has said, has, uh, does the Holy Spirit give faith? Yes, he gives it objectively. That is, he helps you by the grace of God to understand the cross and its implications. But now, on the other side of the coin, you have something in you that fights understanding the gospel. And so, over here, we should put enabling. And that is, for the time in common grace, you're not saved yet, but God the Holy Spirit comes upon you and he acts as a human spirit, but he does one more thing on your behalf. He neutralizes, at least for that moment, the old sin nature. Because if you are still under the control of the old sin na nature, the natural man doesn't perceive the things of the Spirit of God. You're dependent upon God all the way for this understanding. So over here, we'll put subjective. Subjectively, God the Holy Spirit helps you. And in this case, uh, being subjective is not necessarily wrong, as long as it's tied in with the objective truth of the Word of God. Now, what does that do? It enables you to look back and perceive the truth of the gospel. Yes, it's milk. Yes, it's simple. But it enables you to see, see that. What else does it do? It frees you from the realm of the old sin nature so that your volition can now act accordingly. There is no manipulation by God, but then again, there's no manipulation by the old sin nature. The determining factor is now yours. You didn't understand it. God gets all the glory because he gave you the understanding. God gets all the glory because he neutralized your old sin nature. But now the crisis moment in your life, which of course erases all of these Calvinistic tenets, the crisis moment in your life is this. Will I choose to believe or will I disbelieve? If you believe, God acts in, God the Holy Spirit acts in uh, efficacious grace. Am I right here? Efficacious. Is it an E or an I? How, what is it? Efficacious grace. Okay. My brain has not been working this morning very well. I think that's right. Efficacious grace, which simply means that now, once you do believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, He gives you the human spirit that is called being born again and temporarily fills you with Himself. So that at that point in time, you have automatically the filling of the Spirit and a human spirit by which to you can understand God and your relationship with Him.